Sorry for the slight delay, but we appear to be live now. So hello to everyone in the room and also everyone watching us online. Um, hopefully this is the uh, session you're expecting, embedding SQL Server security practices into your pipelines. Um, so let's kick off with it and keep going through. So who am I? I'm Stuart Moore. I've been doing stuff with data for 25 plus years. When I started, people were still dual booting between Windows 3.1 and DOS. Um, and WordPerfect 5.1 was seen as the pinnacle of word processing. Um, Microsoft Data Platform MVP for the last four years, uh, mostly because I'm working with SQL Server and PowerShell a lot for the last 10 years or so. I'm also SIF certified, which means I also do a lot of security work. Um, I have to fill out audit requirements, and this is partly where this session comes from. Um, and I'm part of the team that organizes Data Relay, which is the UK's traveling conference. We're back this year in October doing four dates. We're going from Leeds to Birmingham to Reading to Bristol. Um, and we're looking for speakers. So if you want to come and catch me later, we'll get you the sessionized details because we're really keen to get new speakers coming in this year. Um, and at the bottom, you can see my contact details. Um, so if you want to get those off me after, I've got some little cards as well if you want to take pictures. So what's the problem we're going to be looking at in this session? Well. Security data is becoming a much hotter topic these days. As we know, we've got much more to worry about than we did, say, 20, 25 years ago. We've got the problem for external malicious actors. So you've got your ransomware people coming in. Um, yep, yeah, we've all seen that one. You've got malicious script kiddies. You're just doing it for the lulls because they can say they own the department. They don't actually want the data. They just want to really annoy you. You've got malicious actors within your organization. A lot of people, if you're in sales, would like to walk off with your customer data when they go to a new job, because that's worth a lot of money. Um, or even things, people can get hold of the HR data, and they can start being nasty against people if they see that they're paid a massive differential compared to someone else. And finally, security as well is not just about keeping bad actors out, it's also making sure your data is secure. And that involves doing things like stopping you know, incompetence breaking it. You know, you don't want someone able to alter the data that you're relying on for your business processes. Um, so why is that our problem now as DBAs and data developers? You know, surely that's what the CISO is paid to do in our cybersecurity team. The problem is now that all the data is being pushed back into our central databases. And we're the people who look after those and write the code people use to look after them. So, you know, when it goes wrong, someone can look at us and they want to know why did we do that? Um, so don't know why there's a blank slide there. But anyway, security best practices. Um, this is a session on its own. I've done an hour on this before, and I did seven and a half hours of a pre-con at the last SQL bits that actually ran. But things we want to look at are the standard good practices, least privilege. You know, you want to give someone the minimum amount of access they need to do their job. If someone's job is just to look up customer details, you don't need to give them any ability to modify customer details. Yeah? It's the classic one about sales systems. You, know, you give the operator on the call the ability to enter credit card details, but they can never read them. They can just put them in. Someone else can read them if they actually need to. Obviously, PCI, DSS, and everything comes into that one. Um, you also want to make sure that you've got secure connections. So you want SSL, TLS on all your endpoints. Um, you want to manage passwords. So this is great if you can tie into Windows, because AD does that. There's a lot of tools to age up passwords, check people are using complexity. Um, and it also means it's something for the DBA not to manage. You know, push any bit of your work off to a better system if you can. You know, SQL Server is great for sorting out data. Active Directory is much better for authentication. Pick where you want to go. Um, access via views and store procedures. You really don't want users querying raw tables. Um, you know, that means they can potentially see everything in the table. They can work out some form of SQL injection. If you've got views and store procedures, you can uh, filter down both the rows and the columns they get back. And there's some good tricks you can do with that as the run as command and some case statements so that different people see different sets of data from the same view. Use is role member to push people out. Um, and also, you want to be assigning permissions to people at a group level. You, know, you don't want to be granting Fred a load of permissions and then trying to replicate it to Georgina. 
you'll get it wrong at some point. If someone needs the same permissions, put them in the same group. It's just good sense to do that. Um, so, you know, we look at why we should be doing this, and the problem is we're all human. Most of these reasons up here are because we're human. Um, we all go with good intentions. I'm sure everyone's got a big list of stuff from SQL Bits that they're planning to go back to the office, show your boss, and get it implemented because it'll make your life so much easier. Give it a month when the job list is building up or the new production system's going out, and it will drop off the list and you'll forget about it. It's human nature again. Um, documentation sucks. If you do this, you've got to write it down. No one likes writing it down. And even more likely is when someone's adding a new user, they won't read it, or they'll do something strange. Ah, sorry, I thought he was coming down to have a word with me. Um, <laughs> people get sloppy. Again, that, malicious incom that incompetence maliciousness. You don't mean to do it, but someone puts a star in instead of a list of tables or leaves off the where clause. Yeah, everyone's done a delete without a where clause at some point, I'm sure. Um, and you've got review revulsion. How many people here do code reviews? Yeah, how much fun are they? Yeah, you, you, know, you don't want to do too many of them. You do them because you're made to. So what can we do to improve things? Well, the big thing is to automate it. Rather than relying on us to sort things out, you know, let's source control it. Developers have been doing it for years with their apps. And now we started doing it with our database schemas as well. You know, you've got SQL proj, dat packs, SQL scripts, the source control so you can see what the change has been made. So why don't we do that with our security stance? So you could look and see, this is what was signed off as our security level for this database. Um, and then it shouldn't change unless someone actually goes through the source control process and it's reviewed in a pull request. And then if we've got that, why not check it when we build the database? Again, we don't need to do a code review there. You know, DBA is getting used to a procedure. Do you want to read it or just want to deploy it into dev? and let something else tell you if they've added a security hole or it meets what your security officer has signed off on. Yeah, so that's the idea of this, is how can we automate and make easier our database security monitoring. So how? There's not any real tool that I could find that worked the way I wanted it to. Um, you know, you can drop out your schemas, but then you're reading hundreds of create SQL statements or create login statements. So. I do a lot of work with the DBA tools module. In fact, I wrote the restore and backup stuff in there. Um, so PowerShell was the obvious thing to choose. The idea is that the config is, you know, it's using PowerShell objects, but it drops it out into a semi-readable JSON format. So it's text, so you can go through and review it. And it also means that it's easy to source control. You know, it's just a text file, bunk into the source control, wherever you want. Um, and then the idea is that you can take that JSON file and run a test against your database at any point in time later on. And you should get it's passed or it's failed. Yeah. And that way you know if someone's done something that's against your policy. Um, it's open source, so anyone can jump in and help out. It's just been me committing so far, so I'm hoping that we'll get a bit more traction once this has gone on. And I'm open to ideas if you're not a coder, but I like to promote the DBA tools model of everyone can have a go. Again, there's a build pipeline behind it, so you can try it. If you get a red, fix it. If it goes green, it's great. Um, yeah, so the source is dbasecurityscan.io. It's just a link to the GitHub repository. So if you want to have a look at it, you can do. Um, unfortunately, it's a, it looks a little bit messy this morning because I stupidly forgot to pin the DBA tools version in my demo pipeline. So I spent all morning trying to debug it until I spotted that Chrissy had released a new version this morning. So always pin your module dependencies in your pipelines. If nothing else, take that as your takeaway from this session. Um, so there's a quick intermission while I just kick off a build to prove that it's passing at the moment. And I can come back to it, break it, fix it. So just let me. Um, I don't use PowerPoint a huge amount. And it conf the two screen thing it does now is a. Uh... So. Episode. 
and I am just going to go to GitHub. Because it's not mirroring my display, is it? Oh, it is. You can see it. Good. I want I want the SQL Come on. So we're cutting the name SQL bits DB1. Um, if you met GitHub actions, they're a nice simple way of running code builds within built in with GitHub. So they're free. Um, you know, you've not got as many features as on the paid version, but it's a nice quick one to do. So the idea of this is I've got a repository that's got a database configuration in it and a security configuration. I make a change, I deploy it, I get a red or a green tick. So at the minute, it's passing. All the reds down the bottom are, like I say, because I didn't pin my DBA tools version. Um, so I need to find out actually what's broken, but that was a bit of a panic this morning when that didn't work in the hotel room. The reason I'm doing this now is because I'm not paying for these. It can sometimes take a while for these things to go through. And rather than twiddling our thumbs later on, so what I'm going to do is add a new user called bad to an existing database creation script. Yep. Do the usual git add. Apologies if my keyboard's in the wrong layer. What have I not done? Okay, so just once it's running, I need to whip back to PowerPoint. There you go. We've, we've done the uh, change. So the types of tests we currently have, there's two types of tests within the module. We have policies. So these are true, false. So they apply to everything in the database. So the example I tend to use is the, is everyone a member of a role? i.e. no user should be a standalone user. Any user in the database <laughs> must be a member of a role. Or um, no SQL logins, apart from SA. Um, but you know, if you don't want any SQL accounts, that's the sort of thing you've got. Then the specific types at the moment for users, objects, schemas, and roles. So on the users, for instance, this will check that each user is of the right login type, that all the users exist, expect. Um, it checks that the schemas you want to exist, exist, that the schemas contain the objects you think they should do, that roles have the appropriate permissions and the appropriate members, and that objects that you expect to be there exist and have the right security measures on them. So any one of those changes, it will check. Um, one thing I want to do with this is we double check these things. You have the config and you have the database. So we check the config against the database to make sure the database has everything the config thinks it has in. And we check the database against the config to make sure that everything in the database is checked whether it's in. So that means we catch stuff that's missing both ways. So if you've got a user that should be there and it's missing, we get that when we check the config against the database. If someone's added a new user and not added it to the security description, we get that when we check the database against the config. So the idea is not to give us a way of missing something in the database, because it's quite important we get it right. So there, I'm probably talking too fast. So that is the majority of the slides. So a lot of this now is going to be demos um, and any questions. So if you've got anything you want to ask, feel free to shout out. Um, and I'm just hoping the demo got a smile on me after this morning's fun and games. There. 
Let's see if my pipeline is finished. Now that's still running. It takes about three to four minutes to run if it's a good day. So we do. So just, oh, I shall make that a little bit bigger so I'll just see how big it is, it's all not big it is. Is that more readable for everyone? That's it. Um, I'll share all the, all the stuff will be on GitHub afterwards, so you know, if you just play along with it and then you can go and have a proper read of it afterwards. So just to stop. We're going to have a bit, um, just bring the modules in. I'm going to set up some parameters to use. So this is running locally on my machine. I'm just going to use Docker for this one. This was just to give me a definite demo in case the Wi-Fi went or GitHub had a problem. So that's just some environment variables we use to create. And create a proper Slack to do it. Wait for that to go and a clean Docker instance to spin up. Um, so this again, you don't necessarily need to do everything through a big pipeline. You could just put your DB schema into a Docker container locally. So if you've got devs writing stuff, they can test it locally. Yeah, it's, it, it's nice and fast if you do that. Um, you know, obviously, if you've got a terabyte database, you want to check everything. It's not going to spin up on someone's laptop. If you've got a schema you just want to check, then you can do that. Okay. So let's have a look at the demo DB. You're gonna thank you. Okay, that doesn't want to open up properly. So just a simple database we're gonna create. Um, it's got a couple of users, a couple of members added to roles and some procedures with permissions granted to them. Yep. So nothing too hard. So we'll just spin up that clean database. So we're going to assume that that database is set up securely. Yeah. Obviously, you don't necessarily notice you poked around with it, but let's have an easy way of finding out. So this is where we actually start using the new module. So um, I'm just going to create a new config. For those of you who don't know what a splat is, it's a nice PowerShell way of pushing in a hash table with lots of, lots of um, connection string um, parameters in it. So in this case, I'm just passing through the instance information, the credential information in one variable, and I'm telling it which database to look at. And that's just going to create a PowerShell object called config. Yep. It shouldn't take long, it's a local machine. He says. Hmm. Yeah. I feeling that he's there. Docker whinging about something. No, it's running. Oh, there it's good. It's come through. So now we have a config object. Um, as you can see, it's split into a number of sections. And it'd be much easier if I turn it into a JSON file to make it readable. Thank you. Yes, it is. It works this time. 
So now we have a nice JSON document. As you, it's split into um, four sections. Policy, config, roles, users, schema, and objects. And those really talk about the things that I was talking about earlier. So if I expand the policies node, you can see we have some descriptions of policies. So like I said, there's a policy, all, all users member of a role. And it describes it there. You know, it ensures that all mem users are a member of a role. And currently it's set to false for enabled. Yeah, so it just lists those there and you can toggle them true, false as you need to. So I mean, let's say we've got that one, no SQL logins and no user permissions. So no user permissions means that no user has direct permissions on an object. We, that means you're enforcing data, um, database permission chaining via views and stored procedures. So the users cannot see the underlying tables in the database in any way. Close that. Config is just some information about the thing. It tells you which database instance and when it was created. Um, this is just in case someone isn't source controlling it. At least you can look at the files you've created and see when it was run. That's quite dull, but we can have more things in there as we want. So here's the roles. You see, we have a JSON object for each role. You've got your name, who owns it, any members, any permissions it's got. So this is everything, even if there's no members. And then we get down to, uh, there we go. So DB data writer, Carol is a member of DB, of DB underscore data writer. So we start getting this membership chain. You can see the other ones are empty. Yep. And there we go down to roles that got permissions. So the DB role, DB, oh, <laughs> teeth back in. The DBO role, so the public role owned by DBO has some permissions assigned to it just so people can see things like encryption if they're reading the keys so they can see inside the database. So it pulls all that out. Um, there you go. And we've got another role. You see got users in, it goes in as there. And you can see this role here has two members, Alice and Bob, and it also has permissions granted explicitly to that role. So you can start tracking users through roles and what permissions they have. Users, again, we start working through each user in the same way. So you can see that Alice has permission to connect to the database. Um, is a member of user role. Bob's a member of user role. Carol's a member of data writer. And so on. Yeah. And we can see we have all the internal schemes as well. Schemas, you're probably getting the idea of this now. <laughs> Contains a description of, this, of the, all the schemas. Yeah. Um, so that just gives you an idea where permissions are in schemas. And then we have objects. Yep. So this one I'm just running with user created objects. Because obviously I could dump out all the system objects as well. And I'd spend 30 minutes looking for the object in there. So this one's just pulled out my test stored procedure. So you can see it tells you um, who the grantee is, so who we've given it to, and the permissions they've got on there. So I don't know why it's coming out twice. It's only for me to look at, but you, that's got it. You could, that's probably just a unique missing somewhere. So you see that's quite an easy thing for someone to go through. So if your CISO want to prove that only a certain user or a certain role of users could access a certain store procedure or a table, you can quickly show them through this. You know, just, you know, and again, it's JSON, source controller, it's nice and easy. So that's a nice database. So let's um, change the permissions. So I'm just going to run a query that grants some extra permissions on a role. There you go. That's nice and quick. So what I'm going to do now is just run test again. Same thing. Just, so this time I'm going to run invoke DSS test, which tells it to run the test against the database using the config object we've got there. Should be nice and fast. Um, how many people here have used Pester? Okay, not many. So if I just go through what this is. Pester is a testing framework for PowerShell. You know, it's, like every, it's like all the testing frameworks. You do 
you do something and say this should be, and if it's not, you fail the test. Yeah. So, why is he just running? Greed is good, as you might expect. You can see it's running all these tests now against the database. So it's checking, for instance, here at the schema, it's checking that the DBO schema exists, it should be owned by DBO, and also it checks that it should contain the object. So there we go, that's the reds are fail, and that's where I've created the new user, and it's telling us the principal remove role shouldn't have execute, should have execute on sequel B, yeah, DBO. All the tests you might notice are prefixed by the DB or config in brackets. That tells you which system is being tested against the other one. So if you've got DB in the brackets, it means the error is in the DB. The database has that permission, the config doesn't. Um, just so you know which way to go. So for instance here, uh, it's fine, we've got both on. So here we go, in schemes, you can see I'm checking the schema from the config against the database. And then further down here, I'm checking the database against the config to make sure it should exist in both. Just because if I don't do that, it's hard to know which one's out of sync if you've got a large amount of users. Yeah. So that all comes out, and the results object. No, let's use this because it's in a different mode. Gives you a nice mode, and you see there you've got a failed test count. So if this passes, you get a nice zero. So that is a nice, easy way to put it into your own testing. If fail count is greater than zero, there's a problem with security. Let's go back and fix it. And again, you can see you've got some abridged results there that tell you how many tests of each type passed, failed, and how long it took. So you can quickly see that those two failed ones are, there you go, roles results and object results because it spotted two errors. We've got the um, role has a permission it shouldn't do, and the object has a permission on it it shouldn't do. So some of these things will double up when you get it. But that's because we need to check both ways. It might be the user should have a permission on some, yeah. That's why we have two for one little change. Mm -hmm. So we did get alerted to that, which is nice. Um, if you. It can take a while to check a large database. So it is possible to just check one of the four config options. So this will just check the object config, which saves it doing other bits and pieces. So it may be that you don't really bother too much about users, but you're more interested in objects. Do, do, do. So, I'm always waiting for are there any questions or comments yet? So, I'm also quite happy for feedback on the idea of the tool um, anywhere people want to go. So, there we go. Um, sorry, already run the thing. Results. Um, so, one thing it can do is for some simple things, it can fix the permissions. Yeah? So this is not something you would want to run on a huge database with lots of errors, but it's a quick way maybe of revoking some permissions that shouldn't be there. Um, I'll just run that. Um, it has an output only option, which should just give me the queries it would recommend using. Have a look at that. actually put the SQL query in, um, but it should just do it. So if I actually do a real run now without the output only, that will actually go through and fix that permission because that's a simple one. It just revokes the permission at the object level because you've told it you don't want that permission on the object. So there you go. This time we actually got the SQL query. I must have got something in there with the quiet outputs. So it's told you what it's done and it's done it for you. Yeah. Um, again, that's for simple things. And just to quickly prove it. Let's just run that again. And this time we should see everything's gone green for us.
or these objects that take time. Do do do. There you go, fail, fail test count to zero. So we fixed it, it's back in compliance, everyone's happy, you can show your boss that it wasn't and you fixed it nice and quickly. Yeah. And I say the dry run should tell you the statements, so you can always go to the DBA, the devs and say, look, you've got these extra permissions here, I can just blow them away or you can fix them properly and we'll rerun this afterwards. So as I said before, We've got the config policies, and we can just turn those on. So there's a set DSS assessment policy. You give it the config you want to change, the policy name, and whether you want it enforcing or not. Yep. Then if we do a quick config policy, we can see that that all users should be a member of a role is now true and enforcing. Um, so we'll currently pass. Trust me, I'm just going to actually, just so we don't see too much. So I'm going to create a new user. And run another test. Excellent. So we actually got two here because the user doesn't exist in the user config. But you saw at the very top, We've got a nice handy me message about us having a user who's not a member of a role. Yeah. Um, and the nice thing is with Pester, you can put a because clause on your test. So not only do you get the error, you get a nice why this test has to be enforced. So you know, someone else is running it, so your devs are get, you know, the dev is running it again on your machine. I don't mean to downplay devs on a DBA, but they will be running this. There's a nice clue there of why it's failed, rather than having to bounce it across multiple teams to do it. I like helping people solve things quickly. That's the point of having these pipelines. Um, and then you can disable a, pipe, a policy. And then if we just do the policy check, this will pass. But this is why you would source control your security configuration document because you don't want people turning bits on and off willy-nilly just to get a green. So the demo I'm doing with the pipeline, the security configuration is in my demo um, repository. In the real world, you'd have a separate repository with limited access containing the security document. So ev not everyone can change it. It's like set in stone. Or you know, there's a specific process to get that altered and changed that will involve people signing off on it. Yeah. Um, and again, there's no, if you start a new one, you start off with a dev, in the dev version that you check it's your dev database and you set to test and you eventually get to prod once someone signed off on it. Ta, thanks. Um, so, that's the working it locally. So just looking at the pipeline now. So, as you can see, I added a new user, it failed. I said this is very easy to got two code windows and that's not the one I want. This is it. Um, so I'm using GitHub Actions. Um, Some so of you are using DevOps. Uh, I tend to prefer GitHub. I can get one with YAML. It's a slightly easier setup for me because I just like textiles. I've got a Unix background, so typing things in is quite good. So what I'm doing is I've got an action that works every time there's a check-in. It builds me up a quick Windows 2019 runner. Um, I check out the date that's been pushed up. I was originally installing SQL Express until I found a better image, had it in. I tried DAT packs just to show you can use that. Because I'm lazy, I've moved across using SQL Script. I left that in so people can see you can do this with DAT packs if you're using it for your source control. And then I've got a quick test script, which just installs some modules it needs to do, because I want specific versions of modules. Um, pulls that in, 
sets the location information, creates the database on the test machine, and then runs the tests against it. So it gets the config, which is source controlled, runs it, results, and the last thing in there is I test that failed test count in my results. So it should be zero, because there should be no failing tests. If it's greater than zero, something has failed. If it's negative, you've got a bug in Pester, so go and talk to Jakob about that one. Um, so it should be zero. And because that one returns, that is what actually fails this test. The a bit bigger. So you see, you've got all your pester outputs, but here it is actually the one outside of the pester test that fails. So it just goes through and does that. Um, so th this now means that you can just go back into your. You can fix your, your uh, code or your database. Save that. And that will now run up and fix it. Um, So for a little bit of the internals on here, like I say, these tests are purely PowerShell and Pesta. So for instance, this is the objects test. I use the DBA commands to get all the objects in the database, so views, tables, store procedures, and then get all the permissions from the database that apply to everything in the database, because we just can use the objects. And then we start looping through all the objects we know, and we just have a test that says, for instance, here, grantee is the user. So the user should have this permission on this object in this schema based on what the config says. So we just check that against the database data. And that permission should be one or greater. Just because people can have multiple permissions, they're in two groups. So one or greater. This is quite a simple way to filter things and add things into it. Um, you know, they, are, they look complex just because there's a lot of dot notation in here to pull things out from the objects. But it is quite simple to extend. And, you know, this is where I'm hoping that people come on and help me and we could write some more things or people can give me ideas for things they would like to monitor in the database. And policies are much the same. They're just a simple single test. So for instance, this is the all logins um, should all be Windows accounts or SA. So what I do is get all the logins, and if there's anything that isn't of login type Windows or has the name SA, that sh you know if it's greater than zero, that's a fail. So it just drops out quickly. The, you know, these are quite lightweight tests. The time it takes to do the object is just because there's a lot of objects to check in the database. Um, so you can't do much about that. But obviously, checking users depends how many you've got. So we can easily add more policies into things as and when we want. Now let's see if the pipeline has finished. It's still running. So hopefully that's going to return green in a few minutes. Uh, so out of interest, how many people are deploying their database schemas via a pipeline? I think this would be useful. Yeah, that's, that's good. There are other people other than me who think this is a good idea. Uh, there you go. Hopefully, this is now going to turn nice and green. Thank you. Unfortunately, this is the thing with these pipelines when you're not paying for them. They can be variable in the length of time they run. I've had this running less than 90 seconds and over t 12 minutes once. Same code base. So 
So that has run now. We've got a nice green tick. Our security is back to where we thought it should be. So, you know, that's a great way that someone doesn't have to come and ask you about permissions. They can just create the object, put it in if they've got it wrong, fix it, check it in again, it's gone green. So it's just another check to add to your pipeline. Um, and again, you could schedule this to be an overnight job. Just run this check every morning. So yeah, every morning at 6 a.m. just to prove that everything's okay overnight. No one's deployed anything you don't want to. And it's a nice thing to just hand off to someone and say, look, lots of green ticks. We're secure based on what you want us to be. Yeah. Yeah, it saves documenting having to sit there with the auditors all the time. I do like giving the auditors Excel spreadsheets they can just take away. They love it as well. It's easy for them. If the auditors are happy, the management management's normally happy as well. Yep. There you go. So it's all demos. So, like I say, um, that actually ran a little bit faster than I thought it was going to do. But basically, now it's a call to action for people, just things that, you know, obviously I would love feedback on this. The feedback link will come from the next slide. Um, and also I'd like feedback on the tool and how it's going. So if you want to catch me later, I'm around all day. I'm more than happy to talk about it if you think it's a bad idea, a good idea, what you'd like to see. Um, things that are coming in, checking for encryption. So if you've got encrypted columns, making sure they are still encrypted or checking what sort of keys you're using. You know, is TDE set up and how is it set up correctly? Um, have you got auditing turned on? Is it the auditing you expect to be turned on? And I'd like to put some sort of visualization around this as well. Um, there's various things like graph viz that should be able to take it and sort of do a nice link to show this role has all these nice pretty boxes of store procedures underneath it. Again, it's great to have PowerPoint at times to show people, people like it graphically. And any other ideas are more than welcome to hear. Um, you know, if you've got code, that's brilliant. If you've just got an idea, I'm also really happy to hear about that. Um, so there is my feedback link. Um, please fill it in. Um, there are prizes to be won if you fill a lot of these in. And it really does help me. This is the first time this session has been done. Um, it's the first real public showing of this new tool as well. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that. Are there any questions from the room or anyone online? If there's anyone online. Sorry? Oh, okay. Um, in that case, if no one's got any questions, but feel free to come and chat to me after you don't necessarily want to shout it out across the room. Um, but yeah, anything else on the PowerShell DBA tool stuff or anything you want to talk about? Or Oh, thank you. Yep, in that case, go and enjoy, early, enjoy an early lunch and get in before the queues. Actually, I'm only two minutes ahead, aren't I? Oh, no, that's a scheduled time of 12.50, wasn't it? We started late. Yeah, no, so I'm talking to myself. Yeah. <laughs>